We spent the last two lessons really looking at the DNA molecule, looking at protein synthesis, looking at the likelihood, or, and more importantly, the unlikelihood that DNA, the DNA molecule would have ever just spontaneously occurred on its own by natural forces, by the natural uh, things that occur through chemistry and so forth, and how ridiculously unlikely that would, would be. And we looked at those numbers. We're not going to go over that again tonight. But tonight we're going to take a step backward and we're going to assume a gene. We're going to assume that it got here somehow. And we're going to look at the DNA molecule as far as the human genome is concerned. Now again, the likelihood of that occurring spontaneously or through natural processes is virtually impossible. But yet we're going to make that assumption because what's happened is when the human genome was finally uh, unveiled and, and decoded, and then the genome of other animals now, many, many other animals now, the, the genome has been decoded, uh, that gave the evolutionists even more uh, what, they, what they would consider evidence for evolution beyond the, the DNA molecule and beyond the origin of life. So for our purposes, we're going to assume a gene. What is the human genome? Well, the genome, or what is the genome of anything? The genome is basically, basically the genetic makeup. It's the DNA. So when everybody says the word genome, they're talking about the genetic makeup of that organism or in that, that animal. And of course, if it's the human genome, we're talking about the uh, genetic makeup of the, of, the, uh, uh, of, of the human species, Homo sapiens, as we're referred to. That's what the word genome means. DNA represents only 15% of the chromosome. You think of the chromosome and that's DNA. Really, it's only about 15% of any individual chromosome is actually DNA. There's a lot more to the chromosome than just DNA, but the DNA is the coding part of the chromosome. But DNA also has RNA in it, also has other proteins. The word DNA, uh, or, or the word chromosome, actually comes from the word dark body, because when you looked at them under, when they looked at them under, under a microscope, the chromosomes look dark, hence the word dark body. And it's interesting when you look at the number of chromosomes because as you can tell if you read the, uh, uh, the article I wrote uh, before tonight, that the number of chromosomes clearly doesn't determine the complexity of the organism, does it? Humans have 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs. Uh, chimpanzees or apes has 48, so we lost one somewhere down the road um, when we evolved. Uh, dogs have 78, butterflies 138, protozoans are a particular protozoan, 1,600 chromosomes. So the number of chromosomes doesn't determine the complexity of the organism, assuming you consider a human being more complex than a protozoan, which I think most of us would make that assumption, would you not? So the number of chromosomes, and how that is explained evolutionary, nobody's ever, I've never heard how that's explained evolutionary. but. It doesn't matter because they believe it anyway. So, well, maybe the bass player is different. Maybe the number of chromosomes is different, but all those 1,600 chromosomes in the protozoan have a whole lot less base pairs. Well, that doesn't work either. Humans have an estimated 2.9 base pairs. You remember what base pairs were. A lungfish has 130 billion, humans 2.9 billion. A frog has 6.7 billion. Frog has, what is that, twice as what we've got. And a particular amoeba, has 670 billion. So that's, I just think that's interesting. It really doesn't have that much to do with what we're talking about specifically tonight, but I, again, I just thought that was interesting to show that when you look at organisms, the number of chromosomes, the number of base pairs doesn't determine the complexity of that. The human genome, as we talked about, was decoded in 2003. So we've known about the human genome uh, for about, what, 11 years now, 10, 11 years now. Uh, the chimpanzees uh, genome was decoded, I believe, in 2005. Uh, I throw chimpanzees and apes in the same category. That's probably not technically correct, but I may use those interchangeably. And if you're real technical, I'll apologize for that. But when I say chimps, apes, I'm talking about the, the, putting them in the same category, more or less. Uh, the human genome, as we said, is extensive. If you were to read one letter of the human genome and it take you one second to read each letter of the human genome, one base pair is what we're talking about there, it would take you 31 years to finish. So it's very complex, very detailed. And when you, Francis Collins, our good friend that uh, was the head of the Human Genome Project, uh, uh, physician, also a geneticist, when he looked at it, 
And again, we've talked about Francis Collins a lot in this class. He's a, he is a Christian. He believes in Jesus Christ. But yet he still believes in evolution. And when he unveiled the genetic code of the human genome, it gave him com what he considers, quote, compelling, compelling evidence, unquote, that evolution had to have taken place. And so the first part of the lesson tonight, I'm going to be talking about what he saw in the human genome that made him make that kind of statement. And then we're going to answer that. That's how, how, what we will do. So what did he see in the human genome that gave him this kind of evidence? The first thing was, and he, he said basically there were surprises that they weren't expecting to see. That these were things that occurred that caught them by surprise, uh, more or less, or at, least, or at least him. And one of the surprises was how little of the genome is used to code for protein. At the time of the discovery in 2003, it was about 1.5%. 1.5% of the human genome was actually used in the production of protein, and it only represented 20 to 25,000 genes. And when we talk about genes, we're talking about the code that codes for protein. That's what a gene is. It codes for protein. That was way less than they thought we were going to find, by the way. They thought it was going to be at least 100,000 genes, and it was a lot less than that. But what they found was there was a lot of, or in their opinion at least, was there was a lot of useless DNA. This was referred to as junk DNA because it had no apparent functionality. It didn't seem to be doing anything. It was just there. So the way that you can look at this, you remember the concept of vestigial organs? You know, the appendix and the earlobe and the little toe, and I can go on and on to the supposed vestigial organs that evolutionists use for a long time. They don't use it so much anymore because we're finding out what? More of those vestigial organs actually have a, a function, but they were supposed to be leftovers from evolution. Well, that's the way junk DNA is looked at. It's leftover. Uh, human species doesn't need that DNA, but at one time during our evolution, that DNA was needed. So it's leftover DNA, it's junk, has no function. And this this was really big. This was a big argument for, uh, for uh, Francis Collin, Collins when he looked at the DNA and his, and his belief that evolution had to occur. The second surprise was that the number of genes in humans, uh, the number of genes in humans that were similar to other basic organisms. In other words, there was a lot of the gene structures, a lot of the, the base pairs lined up that were very similar to other organisms. And this was surprising to him. The third argument was, or the, the third surprise that he had, and this is not really an argument necessarily for evolution, but it was a surprise to Francis Collins, and that is 99.9% .9 of us are identical as far as our gene. So even though we don't look alike, you know, we're all 99.9% .9 identical. That's for all races, which surprised him, apparently, when he looked at the human genome. So what separates all the various races of mankind is a 1% difference in our genetic makeup. It's not very much. And another thing, now this is similar to the junk DNA. These are referred to as ancient repetitive ele elements, or AREs. They call these jumping genes, capable of inserting and copying themselves uh, in various other locations in the genome without any functional consequence. So when you read this, it's a little confusing because the, jump, the jumping genes are called, the AREs, make up part of that junk DNA but not all of it. About 45% of the junk DNA is made up of these ancient repetitive elements. Kind of that, that's kind of a prejudicial use of that word already, isn't it, when they use the word ancient, because they're assuming evolution. And you, know, you need to understand when scientists look at this kind of stuff, they've already assumed evolution to occur. And then another thing was, and we've already briefly mentioned this, but he looked at the similarity of chimps. And he saw that there was about 96, we share about 96% of the DNA between, uh, between chimps, humans and chimps do. Now that number varies a little bit. You'll see 98%, you'll see 96%, you'll see 94%, and we'll explain that a little bit later. But there's a, there's a close similarity no matter what number you use, whether it's 96 or 95 or 98%. There is a, there's a lot of the genes in chimpanzees and apes that are similar to the genes in humans. And for, for, uh, for Francis Collins, this was a, another bit of evidence for evolution. And finally, uh, Francis Collins looked at the molecular clock. And to him, this was really a, a, a case for evolution. And we'll talk about the mo mo uh, molecular clock uh, a little bit later. 
but that was a way of looking at the, 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 the uh, genome, looking at the, the chromosomes, and looking at how many mutations would have had to have occurred to get from this animal to this animal, and being able to determine, since we know how many mutations it takes and how long does it takes a mutation to occur, you could kind of use that as a clot to age the, uh, the animals. And this was good, and make a family tree out of it, which was even more important to make a tree of life, if you will, out of the molecular clock. So these were compelling, compelling uh, reasons for Francis Collins to believe that the genome was uh, a proof of evolution. And yet, I guess you could say a little bit in his defense, he's not saying humans and apes are the same. He understands there's a difference. And he, he lists in his book, humans possess a moral law, a language, altruism, they exhibit agape love, ability to imagine a future, and a universal search for God. I would agree with all that. My question is, where does he think that came from? I, he would say it came from God, but when, if we evolved from apes, did that occur? Of course, he wouldn't be able to answer that. And most people that believe in this theistic evolution, they can't answer that either. So a comparison between a chimp and human sequences, interesting as it is, does not tell us what it means to be human. That's Francis Collins. So the question is, is the human genome really riddled with useless information? Is that a true statement? I can't stress this enough. This idea of junk DNA and the fact that there's useless information in the genome is a real big deal for evolutionists. It's a real big deal. In fact, they jumped on this. When the human genome was announced in 2003 and then uh, the, the evolutionists started looking at it, and then we started looking at the evolution of other animals. This was a big deal because, you know, why would God put useless DNA in us if he was making us from scratch? You see their argument? So it was a big deal. I can't stretch that too, too much. Ken Miller, an evolutionist, says, the critics of evolution, that's you and me, like to say that the complexity of the genome makes it clear that it was designed, but there's a problem with that analysis, and it's a serious one. The problem is the genome, genome itself is not perfect. In fact, it's riddled with useless information, mistakes, and broken genes. That's what we just talked about, this so-called junk DNA. <coughs> and Philip Kitcher puts it this way, if you were designing the genomes of organisms, would you not fill them up with junk? Or why would you do that? You wouldn't do that. You would not fill them up with junk. Now, before the genome was ever discovered, William Densky had already addressed this in 1998, and he made a prediction. And he said, on a new evolutionary view, you would expect a lot of useless DNA. On the other hand, organisms are designed, if organisms are designed, you would expect DNA as much as possible to exhibit function. This was 1998. This was before the human genome. So he looked maybe to the evolutionist as somewhat foolish when the human genome was finally discovered because of this useless DNA that was in the human genome. And that was 1998. And this was what his prediction was based upon, based upon a creationist point of view, intelligent design point of view, I should say. However, there's a problem. As time has gone by, since 2003, we're finding, in, we're finding more and more that there is no junk DNA. There is no useless DNA. Stephen Myers in his book, uh, Darwin's Doubt, the discovery in recent years that non-protein coding DNA performs a diversity of important biologic fun functions has confirmed this, Dembski's prediction. In other words, there is no junk DNA. So one of the biggest arguments that the evolutionists have uh, using the human genome or the genome of, for this useless DNA doesn't fly because we're finding more and more that there is no junk DNA. In 2003, excuse me, 2012, so we're talking about nine years after the initial discovery of the human genome, three different, journal art, three different journals came out and started looking at this so-called junk DNA. These are not, excuse me, these are not creationists. These are not uh, biblical creationists. These are scientists, okay? They came from such journals as Nature, a Genome Research, uh, and genome biology, and they had the acronym ENCODE. It was the ENCODE project, and their job was to uh, in, be the encyclopedia of DNA elements. And they came up with a concept that 80% of the genome performs significant biologic functions. You know, so this 
this concept that only 1.5%? That's a lot of big, that's a big difference. And even the evolutionists have to admit that they're finding more and more that this junk DNA is doing something. It's not just laying around their remnants from, from, uh, from our evolutionary past. And so they don't, they don't, they don't really like the ENCODE project. Evolutionists don't because it kind of shoots their argument down. But the point is, there is no junk DNA. And this is what the so-called junk DNA does. And it's an elaborate list, but I think it's important to look at it because someone's going to tell you there's junk DNA. Well, this is what the junk DNA does. These non-protein producing, non producing DNA performs many functions, including the regulation of DNA replication, regulating transcription, marking signs for programmed rearrangements of genetic material, influencing the proper folding and maintenance of chromosomes, controlling the interactions of chromosomes with nuclear membrane, controlling RNA processing, editing, and splicing. Splicing, by the way, is the reason we may not have as many chromosomes or DNA as other organisms. It's an, it's an amazing thing we'll look at in a minute. Modulating transcription, regulating embryologic development, repairing DNA, and aiding in immune defense, in immune defense and fighting disease. That's a lot of functions for something that's supposed to be junk. Would you agree with that? There's no junk DNA. Jonathan Wells has actually written a book called The Myth of Junk DNA, and he points out that there simply is no junk DNA. So, and even that 20%, that 2012 they didn't know of, that number is changing. There's getting less and less and less. In actuality, there probably is no junk DNA. So it really shot down that argument. All right, let's look a little bit at the molecular clock. By Linus Pauling and Emil Zuckerlindel, Zuckerkandel, proposed this. And this kind of graphically shows that with the, the mutations that occur, you're able to determine how far apart organisms are from one another based upon the rate of mutation. So comparing DNA sequences of their protein products, you could determine how organisms are related. The more closely the DNA resembles each other, the more closely the organisms are. If mutations occurred or accumulated over time, the number of differences between the organisms could serve as a molecular clock. And this could indicate the number of years that have passed since the DNA and proteins were the same. Now we understand, because we've been in this class a while now, that they've made a lot of assumptions with that molecular clock, have they not? And they have. And so is, is there really a molecular clock? And sometimes it'll be referred to as molecular phylogeny. In Francis Collins' book, The Language of God, this was a big deal to him. It basically was a slam dunk. So when you program these computers, it can produce a tree of life. Um, and so what's the problem? Well, there's significant problems with the tree of life. First of all, and the molecular clock. First of all, it doesn't fit the fossil record. When we look at the fossil record, it doesn't fit. Secondly, you can get different molecular clocks. And the, the, the molecular clocks can be uh, different by as much as a billion years. Now, even for evolutionists, a billion years is a long time. So when using the molecular clock, variation in ages of organisms differ greatly by as much as one billion years from one type of molecular clock to another. And comparisons of different molecular clocks uh, generate different trees based solely on divergent anatomical characteristics and are often contradictory. And obviously the molecular clock assumes evolution. So molecular models are based on several assumptions that can't not be proven. First, mutations occur at constant rates. That's an assumption they would have to make. And the biggest one is that mutations have the ability to produce evolution in the first place. That's a, you know, that's a big assumption, uh, a big assumption. And so according to Antonis Rokas, a complete and accurate tree of life remains an elusive goal. And he's not a creationist either. And according to Stephen Meyer, the evidence of molecular and anatomical supporting a single um, unambiguous animal tree is manifestly false. And it turns out that really the predictions of Pauling and Zucker Kendall were simply wrong to assume the gene of similar similarity indicates the degree of evolutionary relatedness. Just not true. Now, do mutations occur? Well, I mean, we all know they do. Mutations do occur. And mutations can cause variation with individual kinds. They can make some variation with individual, within, within individual kinds. But the question is, can mutations cause a significant change in the morphology of the organism? Now I'm not talking about a calf born with two heads. 
or, you know, or someone born with an extra finger. I'm talking about a, a distinctive change in the morphology of the organism and not a gross mutation like that. Besides, are those mutations, when you see them like that, ever functional? And do they, do they help the organism? No, they do not. And there's compelling evidence that mutations cannot significantly be responsible for morphologic change. According to Murray Eden of MIT, and remember, remember why I star from last week, he believes mutations had virtually no chance of producing new genetic information. And then we have Stanislaw Ullum. The evolutionary process seems to require many thousands, perhaps millions, of successive mutations to produce even the easiest complexity we see in life now. It appears naively, at least, that no matter how large the probability of a single mutation is, uh, should it even be as great as one half, you would get this, this probability raised to a millionth power, which is so very close to zero that the changes of such a chain, chain seem to be practically non-existent. So the biggest argument against mutations, or one of the biggest arguments against mutations, is that morphology is simply not determined solely by DNA. DNA is not the only thing that determines the morphology on how a, an organism looks. One argument here is, is for looking at proteins. <coughs> so this comes from Stephen Meyer as well. Now proteins, the function of a protein is determined by its shape. How the protein is shaped, that's really what determines how it functions. Not just the DNA and the molecules lined up a certain way, but it's kind of like how, having a key and a lock and a key. For a protein to work, it has to have a certain shape. And proteins are three-dimensional, primary, secondary, and these tertiary folds are sheets. Now the problem is, when a mutation occurs in the DNA, it doesn't fundamentally change the shape of that protein. So it's not going to fundamentally change the morphology of the individual. So even if you had a mutation within the DNA, it would not be enough to change the morphology or change, or change the protein. Proteins must create new folds to affect a change in the organism, but slight changes in DNA do not fundamentally change the organism. Natural selection has nothing to help generate new folds. And you've got to change the folds or the shape of the protein, not just a little bit of its DNA. And if you do change significantly that fold, then it becomes totally unfunctional and doesn't produce anything. So for evolution to occur, Minor or slight mutations in DNA will not work, yet large-scale changes destroy the organism. We've heard this sort of before, but that's why. Large, large, uh, large wholesale changes in, uh, in the DNA will destroy it, and minor ones will not work for evolution to occur. Research on animal development and macroevolution over the last 30 years, research done within the neo-Darwinian framework, mutations has shown that the neo-Darwinian explanation for the origin of new body plans is over like, overwhelmingly likely to be false and for reasons that Darwin, Darwin himself would have understood, Paul Nelson, the University of Chicago. Now, let's talk about epigenetics. Now, epigenetics has been, de has been described by Jonathan Wells as possibly the absolute death. If, if all we've studied so far hasn't been a death blow to evolution, Epigenetics very way, may very well be the final death blow if they'll at least acknowledge it, which I'm sure they will not. But what is epigenetics? The word epigenetics or epigenes being outside the genes. It's not the gene. It's not the DNA. It's something else that causes morphologic changes. And for evolution to occur, mutations in the genes is the framework for evolution, correct? That's how evolution, that's what we're told. That's what the word neo-Darwin means. It means mutations. It means changes that occur through mutations in the DNA. But d epigenetics is not DNA. It's an important concept. Morphology or structures of organisms are not determined solely by DNA. A lot of genetic information is beyond the DNA molecule. And so neo-Darwinism neo -Darwinism gives primacy to the gene. And yet we know body plans are stagnant over time. Things don't really change. They vary, but they don't change morphologically. And they're static over time to a large extent because of epigenetics. And again, epigenetic basically means beyond the gene. It really had its field of the beginnings back in 1924, German scientist Hans Spiemann and Hilda Mangold doing experiments with nude embryos. 
and the way they arranged new, new embryos and how these embryos developed out with, in some cases, the, the DNA actually removed from the organism uh, proved that there was more going on than just DNA. And the point is, and Stephen Myers makes it uh, very well, a lot better than I can, if DNA is not wholly responsible for body plan morphogenesis, then DNA sequences cannot mutate indefinitely, or DNA sequences can mutate indefinitely and still not produce a new body plan, regardless the amount of time and the mutational trials available in the evolutionary process. Genetic mutations are simply the wrong tool for the job at hand. So what are we talking about? He likens it to kind of a construction site where you have lumber, wires, nails, drywall, painting, windows, that's DNA. These materials themselves do not determine the body plan or the plan. They're the materials for making it, but they don't determine it. DNA does not by itself direct how individual proteins are assembled into larger systems such as cell type, tissue organs, and body plans. Three-dimensional structure or spatial architecture of body plans is determined during embryogenesis and by other sources of epigenetic information. And we're going to give some examples of those. Again, DNA does not by itself direct how individual proteins are assembled. You have to have something else doing it. So we're not going to, uh, we could get into great detail, and that's not the purpose of this, of this uh, class to do that. But here are some examples of what we're talking about when we're talking about epigenetics. These are things that are not in the DNA, and yet they have a lot to do with how the organism looks and how the organism is arranged. Microtubules make up the cytoskeleton that generate from each other, not from DNA. Histones are involved in the sequencing of proteins. They regulate storage and activation of DNA, but the histones themselves are not regulated by the DNA. They're the source, but they're the source where protein takes place. Centrosomes from the mother egg from pole, uh, form the poles of the organism, telling you what's going to be the head, what's going to be the, 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 uh, the feet or the tail in some animals. Centrosomes from, other, uh, from the mother egg form poles and replicate themselves but have no DNA. Ion channels and electronic uh, magnetic fields are significant, have significant morphologic effects. And, well, of course, an electronic magnetic field is not derived from DNA, and yet it has a, uh, has a, a strong effect on the organisms. And this has been shown experimentally over and over again. So it ain't all about the DNA. That's the point. And then you have the sugar code. Just, like, just as you have uh, DNA is coded to, to make proteins, there's a sugar code as well. And the sugar code influences embryonic development and protein patterns and are trans, transmitted directly from the parent to the daughter membranes, not DNA. And so it may seem like a, a technical point, but the fact that you have all this epigenetic information that is in the cell causing a lot of things to, trans, to, to trans, uh, transpire yet they're not regulated by the DNA, there is no evolutionary co uh, mechanism for that. There's just no evolutionary mechanism for it. Y you know, so even if you thought DNA could cause a change in the organism, you'd have to explain this as well. So what's the point? Epigenetic structures are not vulnerable to mutations, and even if they were, it would result in the death of the organism. Traditional neo-Darwin arguments do not work with epigenetics. And even though epigenetics has been around or so, sort of had its infancy in 1924, we're still learning just a whole lot about it. We're still a lot to learn uh, in the field of epigenetics. Evolutionists have an answer for epigenetics, like they have an ex answer for everything, or at least they think they do. And one of the explanations is the Hox genes. Hox genes regulate the expression of other genes involved in the animal development. So it's the Hox genes that explains all the epigenetics. Well, Kenneth Stewart Thompson expressed doubt that large-scale morphologic changes can accumulate over time and produce minor changes at the genetic level and could ever cause whole, organism, whole cell changes in the organism. Geneticist George Miklas of all, the Australian National University has argued Neo-Darwinism fails to provide a mechanism that produce large-scale innovations. Starting in the 1970s, many biologists began questioning uh, 
neo-Darwinism's adequacy in explaining evolution because they couldn't explain epigenetics. Genetics might be adequate for explaining microevolution, but not uh, mac uh, but microevolutionary changes in gene frequency are not seen as able to turn a reptile into a mammal or to convert a fish into an amphibian. Has that not what we've been saying all along? Just doesn't have that ability. Microevolution looks at adaptation that concern the, the survival of the fittest, not the arrival of the fittest. I thought that was good. So it's doubtful that Hox genes could transform animal life at all. Just doesn't give an adequate explanation. Experimentally gene generated mutations in the Hox gene has universally proved harmful. When you start monkeying with the Hox gene, the, the organism dies. So if you had a mutation in the Hox gene, you're in trouble. The organism's going to die. Hox genes typically expressed after the beginning of animal development. The Hox genes don't express anything until after the development starts. It's those epigenetics that explain the other stuff. The electronic magnetic fields, the centrosomes of the mother cell, those sort of things, those are involved in that. The Hox genes have nothing to do with that. And well after the body plan has begun to be established. And number three, Hox genes themselves do not contain information for our building structural parts. Epigenetic, epigenetic information in structure determines the function of many Hox genes. So the very thing they're saying it regulates, epigenetics determines the structures of the Hox genes themselves. The other thing that they will argue from is the developmental gene regulatory networks as a possible cause of the creative power of evolution. Uh, you know, the, the cell itself is like, um, it's almost like what we talk about, it's kind of computer-like. There's a lot of circuitry that's in there, and there's a lot of regulation that occurs. And so evolutionists say developmental gene regulatory networks then are responsible for the creative power of the evolution. Problem with that is, and I, I show a picture there of how a circuit network would look like in a circuit board. The problem with that is when you start, again, monkeying with the regulatory uh, powers within the, the cell, the cell's going to die. It's not going to survive. Dr. Eric Davidson at the California Institute of Technology, again, not a creationist, demonstrated the so-called DGRNs, that's what these developmental regulatory genes, the acronym for them is, actually make the organism resistant to change and cannot vary without causing catastrophic consequences. So, one more thing. Dr. Davidson in Meyer's book, Darwin's Doubt, there is always an observable, co observable consequence if a DR, DGRN subcircuit is interrupted. Since these consequences are always catastrophically bad, flexibility is minimal, and since the subcircuits are all interconnected, the whole network partakes of the quality that there is only one way of things to work, and indeed the embryos of each species develop in that way. You can't do anything to these genes without destroying these regulatory genes without destroying the organism. So epigenetics then represents a very powerful challenge to neo-Darwinism. The kind of mutations evolution, there, evolution needs do not occur and the small changes adaptation cannot be the mechanism for large changes even if this seems so intuitive to the evolutionists. And this is the thing, it just seems intuitive. You know, it just looks like it works that way. It's just intuitive. So this, even though it seems that way, it's not scientifically correct. Uh, I rushed through that because I didn't know how long it would take me to get through. We have probably just about five minutes. Any questions? This is the time that if you have any questions, whether it has to do with this or not, we do not have time to get into part three. Uh, we will save that till uh, our, our next lesson. Uh, but do you have any questions on either epigenetics or any of the stuff we talked about either in the last class or this class? Yes? You may have hit on this and I missed it. The the evolutionists, they use the Hox gene, but do they acknowledge that it's almost always a negative impact? Uh, they acknowledge it, but they still, you know, it's kind, of, it's kind of like what we did last week. You, you can show the probability of life occurring uh, spontaneously or through natural process, and you can show that the likelihood is, is, you know, 10 to the 140th power, but to them it doesn't matter. They're looking for some way to explain evolution. This is the point. So if evolution cannot be explained through the mutations or new neo-Darwinian concepts, 
And at the very end of this lesson, we're going to talk about the new theories of evolution. And the reason they have to come up with, with new theories is because the old theories don't work. So they may acknowledge there's a problem with the Hox gene, but it's all they've got to hang on to right now, or, or one of the things they have to hang on to when it comes to evolution. So the deal is, evolution had to have occurred. That's just the mentality of the scientists. It's now figure out how it occurred, and we start shooting down one problem, especially with Neo-Darwin, and I don't see how an evolutionist could even hold on to the Neo-Darwin concepts anymore, mutations as a cause. I just don't. With everything we've seen, to, we've seen mutations just simply cannot cause significant change in organisms to make one kind become a different kind. So they're coming up now with new theories. And the Hox gene is one theory, and we'll look at some of those other theories at the end of the class, but uh, I think we're seeing the death knell of Neo-Darwinism personally. And when I say Neo-Darwinism, again, mutations as the cause for evolutionary change because they don't, they don't really have good answers for this. Well, we're going to talk about that. We don't have time. Now. They've got other theories because they've got to have a theory. Because it, it, Remember, it has to be naturalistic. And so that's one of the problems you get into, and I'll get ahead of myself a little bit, but that's one of the problems you get into when you start looking at the uh, fossil remains of ancient men and apes and our ancestors. And remember Lucy, you know, that was in, in the National Geographic. They want to interpret those fossils based upon evolutionary thought. And when something, like there was one fossil that was supposed to be three million years old. Well, someone explained to them well, that's impossible. That cave, they, did, they were able to determine that the cave that it was found in could only be a million years old. So you can't have a fossil in that cave that was three times the age of the cave. What do evolutionary uh, do? They go back and say, well, we were wrong about the date. You know, they, so they will always interpret everything from a naturalistic point of view. So it's, it's all, that's why I said earlier, there's some people you will never convince because it's already determined. Those are the people who are going to have trouble convincing no matter what we have. But the people that are on the bubble, those are the people this class can help.